The human mind has always been curious about what lies beyond its reach. What lies beyond the tree floor? What lies beyond the entrance of the cave? Beyond the next mountain, the sea, the ocean, and eventually the horizon? What opportunities are there? Are there um, safer or better places to live? This early drove us to wonder what lies beyond the Earth itself. <coughs> How many worlds await us and are they inhabited? I've been thrilled by these questions since childhood and I know searching for answers. I'm an astronomer studying planets beyond our solar system, which are called exoplanets. And although the question about their existence has been here for thousands of years, it's only 22 years ago that two researchers at the University of Geneva, based in Sauvergne, in this very canton, uh, detected the first exoplanet around, uh, around the sunlight star. So it's a very, it's a really local story, but it has now a, a worldwide impact because there is more than 3,000 exoplanets that have been detected since there. And there are two main, um, two main facts that scientists have established. And the first one is that planets are ubiquitous. Nearly every other star hosts a planet. 20% of those host at least a planet that is the size of the Earth. Now there is a 100 billion star in our galaxy, so that would make for 20 billion Earth-sized planets. It's mesmerizing. But the second fact is to me even more striking, and it's the fact that there is a, a fantastic diversity among the planet discovered. It's beyond imagination. But it's actually my job to try and imagine it. And it's very important, this diversity, uh, because how a planet looks like today uh, reveals how it formed. And if you are able to understand the processes at the origin of all the planets we know, then it means that we can explain how our planet formed <coughs> and how uh, life uh, eventually uh, appeared. And so these, these two facts uh, raises, raise two fundamental questions. If life arose on Earth, and there are billions of Earth, is life a common phenomenon in the universe? And uh, however, if there is a huge diversity and life is able to blossom in very diverse environments, very different from our environment, would we even be able to, uh, to see it, to recognize it? So I need to make a simplification here. When we talk about life, I will speak mainly about microbial life which by far dominates the biomass of the Earth. This beautiful organism that you see here is the reason of your presence in this room. Um, it's the first organism, this cyanobacteria, able of uh, photosynthesis. So it's at the origin, its ancestors are at the origin of the, of the oxygen we are breathing. So it literally, two and a half billion years ago, filled the primordial atmosphere of the Earth with oxygen. So it completely changed the atmosphere of the Earth. And it's the very reason why my colleagues and I are looking, uh, trying to look at uh, atmospheres of exoplanets to try and detect such big changes, the existence of, ox of oxygen that could be linked with a microorganism uh, living at the surface of the, of the planet. But in order to thrive, this microorganism needs two main ingredients that are reunited on this, on, the, on this beautiful picture. It needs liquid water at the surface and sunlight. And these two, these two things are, uh, are, are come together in only one place in our solar system, it's the Earth. Now there are other places in the solar system that looks like this, and one of the most striking examples is this one. So this is the glint of the same sunlight on the sea at the surface of Titan, which is Saturn's biggest moon. Uh, the only thing here is that Titan is very far from the Sun and the temperature at the surface is minus 180 degrees Celsius. So it's no liquid water that you see, it's a lake of liquid methane that is actually laying onto uh, um, a bed of uh, rock-solid water ice. 
Now, below this uh, ice shell, there could be some uh, liquid water ocean on Titan or on other uh, moons of, uh, of giant planets, uh, which are all very cold. The only thing is that uh, sunlight cannot reach these places directly. And besides this, uh, the solar system, we need to, to admit, is, does not offer um, a very friendly condition for life to, to, to blossom. Um, so what I will do is, is that I will show you how the, uh, the solar system planet stands in front of a bunch of the thousands of exoplanets we have detected. Having no places like Earth in the solar system makes it really critical to determine uh, is if there is some similar places elsewhere around all the stars. So I will solve the planets by uh, their uh, temperature and, uh, and density, and I will make appear now 500 of exoplanets, for which we know their masses, their sizes, hence their, their, their density, and their distances to the star, so we can assess their approximate surface temperature. Everything you see beyond that on this picture, like colors, stripes, rings, is fantasy. It's an artist's impression. We just do not know. And to me, this is really fascinating because it leaves lots of room for imagination. So playing with the laws of physics, chemistry, and climate sciences, uh, we use that as a sandbox and try to make predictions that we try to verify. And for instance, it would, it would be extremely tempting to look at planets that are rocky planets, that are about the size of the Earth, in the, in the, in the right temperature range so that liquid water could exist at their surface and look into their atmosphere. It's an unfortunate coincidence that these planets are precisely the ones that are the most difficult to detect and the most difficult to characterize. On the contrary, it's much easier to characterize the atmosphere of giant, hot, giant, gaseous planets. And while it seems a tad frustrating at first, uh, the, their study revealed extraordinary findings that teach us about uh, planets that are more like Earth. So I would like to share with you now one of this, of this example. Um, it's maybe the, the, the most exciting discovery I made in my, uh, in my career, and it's about a planet that is about the size of Neptune. So Neptune is up there in the cold part of this diagram, and this planet that is emphasized here is called GJ436b. Um, <laughs> Neptune is called an ice giant in spite of being mainly composed of, of gas. Uh, we don't quite, we're not quite sure given the temperature here that we should call these planets gas giants. So by, we call them basically hot Neptunes uh, by lack of uh, more adapted terminology. And it's hot because it's very close to its star. So let me uh, try to give you the, the feeling of how close it is. In our solar system, Mercury is the closest planet to the Sun. It orbits around the Sun in just 88 days. That's just one year for the Earth. If I take the system of GJ436 and I put it instead of the Sun, this is what its orbit would look like. It zips around the star in just three days. Okay, your birthday every three days. Pretty cool. Um, but it's, it means that the planet suffers a, a really extreme environment in terms of stellar irradiation. Fortunately for it, the star is much smaller and colder and redder than the sun. And that actually makes it easier to uh, observe the atmosphere of the planet. And the key thing here that makes it possible is the fact that as seen from the Earth, the planet is seen passing in front of the star. We call this a transit. When the planet transit blocks a tiny bit of the of a fraction of the starlight, and it, when it has an atmosphere, an even tinier fraction uh, is uh, actually filters actually the starlight. And if you are able to um, to analyze the light that has filtered through this atmosphere with a dedicated instrument called a spectrograph, we can retrieve the composition of the planetary atmosphere. The only thing is that it's really challenging because, as you can see, the, the area covered by the atmosphere at the surface of the star is very small. So it's very small signatures. So my idea to characterize this atmosphere was try to get to, to detect the, the lightest possible species in the atmosphere, because it would then be uh, on the top of the atmosphere and would maybe cover a bigger fraction of the surface of the star, making the signal bigger. Um, Neptune is mostly composed by hydrogen, which is precisely the lightest gas in the universe. So I thought, okay, let's propose to observe, to detect hydrogen in this, in, in this planet. 
and the observation were only possible uh, with the uh, help of the Hubble Space Telescope, which is a very competitive instrument if you want to basically all astronomers want to observe with it because it's a kind of a Rolls Royce. Uh, so there's a lot of demand. Uh, actually, it took me four years to convince my peers in the selection committee of uh, the observing programs there that it was worthwhile to pursue this, this observation. But when, after, um, after several years, I eventually obtained all of my data, this was 2014, um, I was flabbergasted. Because what I saw and that I'm going to show to, show to you uh, is just something that nobody was prepared to see. What you see here, and I know it doesn't look very impressive, and it's so because it's raw data from Hubble. So what you could see looking at the detector of Hubble, really putting your, your, your eye on it. So it looks all dirty because it's, it's not been uh, properly uh, reduced. Uh, it's actually the image of the star through a spectrograph. Um, Whatever the shape, the interesting thing is that is to compare what the data set obtained when the planet is not in front of the star to the data set obtained when the planet is in front of the star. And the sharper eyes among you might have noticed a decrease of the, of the starlight in the, the circle region here. And the fact that we can see that in raw data is absolutely extraordinary. It means that the amplitude of the signal is huge, which means that the atmosphere of the planet must be huge in front of the star. How huge? This is what my team and I tried to determine with numerical simulation, and we found out that the atmosphere of this planet has the shape of a giant comet cloud of hydrogen, which was completely uh, a complete surprise. And what we think is happening to this, to this object is that it's so close to its star that the planet is losing its atmosphere to space. The star strips the planet out of its atmosphere, slowly enough that there are still gas around it, but the thing that is really mesmerizing is when you consider that there are planets out there that are much more irradiated than this one, much closer to their star. And actually, this atmospheric evaporation could explain the existence of a population of hot, very hot, very close to their star, rocky planets that does not exist in the solar system. And this path of formation of rocky planets, basically you evaporate a planet made of gas and you leave only the rocky core, is something that never happened around the sun. And it's very interesting to to, to, to consider why it never happened. It never happened basically because the giant planet, Jupiter, Saturn, did not migrate inward close to the sun. And that's very fortunate for us because studies show that if Jupiter had migrated inward very close to the sun, it would have ejected all the small planets on its path, including Earth. So we wouldn't be there today if Jupiter uh, had migrated. So looking at this system, um, reveal how kind of fragile we are in a way. Now, let's finish by getting back to Earth. And so you might wonder, so okay, this is all well and nice, but how do we characterize the atmosphere of a place where we know there is there could be life? How could we detect oxygen and, and water in this atmosphere? So I have a good and a bad news. The good news is that you can apply exactly the same technique I just uh, explained to you. The bad news is that Hubble is much too small to detect something, uh, you see the limb of the atmosphere of the Earth. It carries a 2.5 mirror, uh, diameter mirror uh, in space, it's the size of a school bus, but it's much too small. And actually my first job as a PhD student uh, 13 years ago was to determine, to calculate how big a telescope should be to um, uh, to, to, to be able to detect this atmosphere of an Earth-like planet? And the answer is quite brutal. It's 40 meter telescope in space. <laughs> that, did not, that did not discourage me, though. But actually, did I mention that before even doing that, you have to find the good planets that you want to characterize. And then there is a very good news because we are really on the verge of getting such planets. We even may have them already. And especially in Switzerland, we are uh, really uh, on the brink. Uh, we have conceived uh, in Geneva what is common now considered the, the most, the best planet hunting device, uh, the HARP spectrograph, which is installed in a, in a, in a telescope in, in, in Chile. 
uh, we have just delivered last month the successor of this instrument, this giant uh, spectrograph called Espresso, that will collect the light out of four eight-meter telescopes uh, set in, in Paranal, in the Atacama Desert. And that would measure the mass of uh, a planet that is like the Earth, that could measure, measure that. Now, to get the density of such a planet, we need also to measure its size. And for this, we will bring Switzerland beyond, uh, be, be beyond where it has been uh, before. We will bring Switzerland to space uh, by basically building the first Swiss-led space mission, which is a space telescope called uh, CHAOS. And uh, this telescope, it's much smaller than Hubble, but it will be very sensitive and will measure very precisely the size of exoplanets. And it involves a lot of institutions in Switzerland and in Europe. The instrument has been built already in Bern, with what you see at the top of the screen. And the data, it will be launched, uh, it will be ready for launch at the end of next year. And the data will arrive in Sauvergne, near Versoix, uh, in this very canton. Um, so with this set of instrumentation, we are ready to find the right planet. But now, you know, I just said a few slides ago, well, we, you, need, you, need, you need an extremely large telescope to characterize its atmosphere. So, remember this mountain from the introduction? It's called Cerro Amazones, and you might see there's a road uh, that leads to the sun. <laughs> It's also the Atacama Desert, which coincidentally is the best place in the world for astronomical observations. This summit has been engineered, it has been flattened to prepare for the construction of the biggest telescope ever built. It's called, can you guess, the Extremely Large Telescope. <laughs> the size of its mirror is 40 meters. So we have never been that close of being able to detect life elsewhere. And I think this huge mirror uh, makes a good conclusion for this talk because Eventually, uh, a, a mirror is something in which, you, which reflects uh, your image. And um, the, maybe the, the most beautiful idea in all of this is that searching for life elsewhere basically teaches about ourselves. Thank you very much.